we are looking at still looking at uh, Old Testament history, and then we're going to we have uh, after this one we have five or more books. Then I think we are finishing the, all the books in Old Testament. So as you kind of go through, you will see more and more. We're going to summarize all books in the Old Testament. So next Bible week is very important because we want to have a clear idea about Old Testament. Then we will see a clear idea where we are going and what we learn. So 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 14 through 19. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim and you alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear, open, hear, open, hear and open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words of Sennacherib, has sent to insert the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone, but fashioned by man's heart. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we thank you again for giving us the word. Please let this word be your word that, con that controls our hearts and minds. Protect us from all evil spirits so that we can hear your word, understand your will, and make our minds, minds to follow you. We thank you. Right, so, so this is the history, right? And then history begins from Joshua, and then after Joshua we have uh, Judges. Then during Judges, that time we have we look at Ruth. And then after Ruth, we look at First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, as we look at Second Kings today. Then we will look at first and second chronicles. Then Israel, Nehemiah, and Esther will finish the history. It is technically from Genesis, Exodus, we can say they are history too. But this is the history of Israel because when who was it? Joseph after he went to Egypt, the name the nation named Israel. So it, we call from Judges from Joshua we call history of Israel. As we have learned, Saul, the first Samuel, Saul was the first king of Israel. He was ordained to be the king, but he wasn't fully obedient to God. Because of his unfaithfulness, he died in tragedy by Gentile person. Then David came, David became the of the United, United Israel. David was the one after God's heart. He loved the Lord. He always worshipped God. Because of his love and faithfulness, God promised that he would continue to establish kingdom from David's descendants. After David died, his son Solomon became the king. Solomon received the heavenly wisdom. He built the temple of God. The scripture says he was the most rich wife. He was the one more wise and rich than anyone else on earth. He was so blessed. 
But in the later, in his late age, he began to worship idols. He began to depend on himself rather than on God. Because of his sin, because of his unfaithfulness, the nation was divided into two. Northern kingdom, Israel, and southern kingdom, Judah. All the kings after Zeroboam in northern kingdom and all the kings after Rehoboam in southern kingdom are listed in first and second kings. That's what we see, who are seeing now. Two kingdoms existed together until the northern kingdom, Israel, was destroyed by Assyria in chapter 17, second Kings chapter 17. But Judah also would also fall to Babylon in chapter 25, the last chapter. So we see two kingdom comes, but two kingdom will be destroyed in first and second kings. Before we look at our text this morning, I would like to go over how Israel and Judah are different. God said he would keep the kingdom from David's but Jeroboam was the Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, was not David's descendant. And all the kings after Jeroboam were evil. The scripture says that every king did evil just as Jeroboam did. On the other hand, Jeroboam, the first king of the southern kingdom, he was the grandson, he was a grandson of David. He was a righteous leader, but God kept the kingdom from David's descendants. The southern kingdom had only one tribe, Judah. And I wonder if there were more tribes in the southern kingdom, like the northern kingdom. Then who knows? Maybe kings from other tribes could come. And I can see that in God, in his providence kept only Judah to have the kingdom from David's descendants because the Messiah would come from David's descendants. And in our human, in our view, northern kingdom is the true Israel, right? Eleven tribes out of twelve are in northern kingdom. That's why they are named Israel. But it didn't matter to God. God didn't care about nation, but he cared what he promised. He promised the Messiah would come from David's descendants. So he kept in his providence the northern Judah, southern kingdom. And also, as you may remember, the Jews, the Jews looked down on Samaritans in Jesus' day. Jews from the southern kingdom consider Samaritans, the Samaritans from northern kingdom, as Gentiles. Why was that? They're all from Abraham. They all believe David was their father. It was because the Samaritans were not pure Israelites. They were not pure the the, they were not the pure the Israel, Israelites. When the Assyria, Assy, when Assyria conquered Samari, Samaria, the northern kingdom, they have a policy. They didn't want to see any rebellion in Samaria. So they took some elite Samaritans to other nations and they brought other Gentiles in Samaria. So you can guess, after a few decades later, the Samaritans were racially very mixed. Assyria was the strongest empire then, but it didn't last very long. Babylon, another empire, came up and conquered Assyria. And Babylon conquered Judah, and then conquered Judah. But Babylon's foreign policy differed from Assyria's. 
rather than rather than bringing Gentiles into Jerusalem, Judea, they took the Jews into their own country. The Jews in Southern Kingdom remained pure. They were not racially mixed. And later we will see it in the second chronicles, we will see it. the Jews will come back to Jerusalem. They were still pure Jews. <clears throat> Again we see God in his providence not only kept the kingdom but also the nation because <clears throat> Messiah, the Messiah would come from David's now let's look at how the northern kingdom was destroyed. Second Kings chapter 17 it describes the reason. The Israelites, 17 verse 9, the Israelites secretly did the things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortify the city, they built themselves high places, all their towns. They set up all their towns. At every high place, they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them, before them had done. They were supposed to worship God, but they continued to worship idols. And because of that, verse 12, verse 18, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left, and even Judah did not kill the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices Israel had introduced. Eventually, Judah will fall to Babylon. So two kingdoms who are chosen by God, two kingdoms who are built by God, came, would came, had come and gone just like that in history. But there are some things we need to learn. First, we must remember that our ultimate hope, our ultimate hope is not in us. The people thought that they would be justified without Yahweh. That's why they asked to have a king. But their king could not satisfy them. They thought that they would, they, they thought that they would, their king would make them happy. But their kings themselves they sinned against God. Not only that, but also they caused the people to sin. As I said earlier, there was no righteous king in the northern kingdom. There were total 19 kings in northern kingdom, but no one righteous in northern kingdom. In southern kingdom, there were 20 kings. There were few righteous, good kings, like Josiah, like Hezekiah, but even, even they were not perfect. <coughs> the kings must acknowledge the king, the king in heaven but they failed to do so. And this is true for us in our home, church, and nation. We may think, we may think we have perfect leaders, but human leaders cannot satisfy, cannot lead people forever. In home, parents will have to lead children, their children of one day. Pastors will retire. President will be changed every four years. If we depend on human leaders, we will fail when they fail because there is no one perfect leader. Then where is our true hope? Our hope is in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the true King, right? We must depend on Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of Lords. This is the first message from the king, second king. Then we also need to, we also need to recover the essence of faith. It's 
especially in our worship. The Israel was destroyed by Assyria because they worshiped evil, they worshiped the idols. About 120 years later, Judah was destroyed too by Babylon. When they were destroyed, the Jews were shocked because they thought they were God's chosen people. They were supposed to be blessed by God. How could God's chosen people destroy, be destroyed by a Gentile nation? They couldn't understand, they couldn't believe. But actually, God warned Solomon about this. Yes, they were chosen people. They were supposed to be blessed by God, but when they worshipped idols, this is what God wanted Solomon. When they worshipped idols, God left them. The scripture said, God removed them from his presence. Temple was there, but God was not in the temple. So the temple was destroyed. And this can happen to us today. If we express our love to God in our worship and praise, and we pray that God will accept our worship. However, if we do not love God, if we, if we do not remain in God's word, if we do not obey His commands, commands God is not in God is not in the church. God is not in the church where people do not obey. Church could be, the catch is just another building that. Then we are worshiping God in vain. We raise our voices to God. We pray in Jesus' name, but there is no power. Unless we obey, we try to obey his commands. Unless, unless we try to love him more and more, God will be in the church. This is a, a just another building. So how are we supposed to worship God? 700 years later, Jesus explains true worship to a Samaritan woman. After a few conversations, the Samaritan woman realized Jesus must be the Messiah because he knew everything about her life. So she said to Jesus, Sir, Lord, I can see, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers had worshipped on this mountain, high places, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship in Worship is in Jerusalem. So she is, she is Samaritan. She is a Samaritan woman. So Samaritans worship God in the high places. They built their own temple to worship idols. And Jews said, no, no, that's not the right plan. You got to come here in Jerusalem to worship God in the temple, the temple the, the Solomon built. And Jesus replied to he put it to the woman. <clears throat> John chapter 4, verse 21. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. See, it's not about the place. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. You don't know about Jesus. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is the spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and Israel and Judah didn't know how to worship. They thought the Israel, Israel, Northern Kingdom, 
They thought that they could wash anywhere in a high place, but they actually wash idols. Jews, the Jews in Southern Kingdom thought, as long as we wash in the temple, they thought it would be okay. But they didn't know how to wash. It's not about a, about a place, but about how we worship. We worship true worshipers who worship God in truth, in faith, in the truth, and in spirit. In truth and spirit. Truth is in this world. Every element of worship, whether we sing to God, whether we pray to God, whether we listen to the word, read the word, should be based on God's word. And our worship should, led, should be led by the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Holy Spirit means trying to ignore, trying to uh, erase my own thought, my own knowledge, just asking God, God, show me, tell me what I need here today. This is just one of my examples. This is how I worship. You know, I had a, I had another good vision. So when I worship God, I just sit there and I don't want to be bothered by anything else. So I took my glasses off. So I don't see actually the face of priest or anyone, but I just listen, try to focus on the word that I listen to. We have to find a way that we worship God in spirit. Find a way, just try to listen and try to focus on by the Holy Spirit. True worshipers must worship in truth and in spirit. I think we will talk more about the worship, worship God later on. There's so much we need to talk about. But lastly, <clears throat> lastly, we should never forget, never forget that God is on the side of his people. We should never forget God is the side, on the side of his people. The Israel, the Hezekiah, the, in our text, the Hezekiah was the king of Judah when the northern kingdom was destroyed. And he saw how brutal the Assyrians were. Then one day he received a letter, letter that the Assyrians, the Assyrians were invading Judah, Judea. So what did he do? He went up to the temple. And he opened, he spread the letter before the Lord. Lord, look at this. Open your eyes, look at this. And hear my prayer. Then he prayed. Lord, help us. Deliver us from, from this, the, his hand. So that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you are Lord. You are Lord. As he prayed to God. It's, a, how, it's amazing how he prayed. Look at how he prayed. He opened the spread the letter before God. Lord, open your eyes. Open your ears. And he prayed to God. And then God responded to him through the prophet Isaiah. I will defend this city and save it for two reasons. For my sake for my name's sake and for David my servant because he promised to keep David's assignment. Then interestingly, God, the, no, not God, Isaiah, revealing, after he revealed God's promise to Israel, to Judea, Judah, then he spent more time, he talk more about God's anger toward the Assyrians. This is very interesting. He prophesied much more to Assyrians, against the Assyrians. Let me read just a couple of verses, couple, couple of verses. He, his prophets, among his prophets. Verse 22, he says, 
the Isaiah, this is what God said through Isaiah. Who is it you have insulted and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride against the Holy One of Israel? Because you raised against me and your insolence has reached my ears. I will put my hook in your nose and my feet in your mouth, and I will make you return by the way you came. This is interesting. I mean, God said, we knew, we heard, God said he would raise other nations to punish the Israelites. Now he wants to punish Assyria because they, Assyrians, because they invaded. Judah. What is God trying to do? There was his plan to use Assyria to invade, to punish, to discipline his chosen nation. And now he is punishing Assyria because they followed his direction. I think we can understand when we think of our own case, our own example. Let's, let's, let's say I try to discipline my son, um, Nathan, for example. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, I mean, he doesn't need to be disciplined. He's a perfect boy, as you know. But maybe Hannah thinks he needs to be disciplined. But anyway, let's, let's imagine that I need to discipline Nathan. So I will tell him, no more games. I will take his, I will take his phone away. And I might even spank him because he did something wrong. Then one of my neighbors would come over and say, Yes, go ahead, punish him. Nathan is a bad boy, spank him, spank him. And then he even tries to spank Nathan for me. Then I will turn to him. Who are you? This is my son. You have no right punish my son, my own son. See? Let me give you another example. In our church, in the church, we may disagree, we may even argue over some things, but we still love our brothers and sisters because we are called together. We are family in Christ. When I go outside, I will tell people, our congregation is the best one. Our council rocks. True. And then you may also want to say, when you go out, you may also want to say, our pastor is the best. Right? No? <laughs> but uh, I think if you feel uncomfortable to say that, I think you can still say it. I mean, that kind of lie is okay. Because it brings us together. It brings us together. That's what Paul says. You know, Paul said, make every effort to bring unity, unity of the peace, unity of the, the Holy Spirit from, through the peace of the Spirit. That's the calling, actually. We are to do, you know, we are to live worthy of that calling. Judah and Israel, they sin. So God needs to discipline them. God raised other nations, Assyria, Babylon, and later was person person. God raised those people. But they treated God's people mercilessly. They thought that they could destroy any nation, including God's nation. And we heard the Assyrian king said he was God. Because of their pride, they, was, they were destroyed. God punished his people. It is true. God disciplines his people because he loves his people. The brothers and sisters, are you having a difficult time today? Do you feel God is punishing you? But please remember, God is with you. God
God never abandons His people. Even if you feel there is no way to get out, God is with you. It's not the end yet until God says so. Until God says it is end, it is done, you are not, you are not done yet. Even if you feel you are standing before the free wall, God is with you. He will never leave you alone. He will never forsake you. Because you are chosen. As you believe in Jesus Christ, as your Savior and Lord, you are chosen, you are called by God, and you are saved. Even though God may give us hard time, we believe and we trust. Yes, the Lord is with me. Until when? Until we hear that God says, well done. You will be with me today in paradise. Until we hear that word, we have hope in Christ. And we do live today because God is with us. Listen to what God says to you this morning. Do not fear, for I am your God. Do not be dismayed. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right Amen. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for giving us the word. We see the we see all God's nations uh, were destroyed. And then we could take negativity. We could take it. We could be depressed, disappointed. But Lord, your word tells us that God is with us. As we believe in Jesus Christ, who died in our place, God never abandons us. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. And help us. We can walk with you and try to obey your commands so that we may be blessed more and more. You are our God. In Jesus' name we pray.